I think, yeah, I guess when I read the book of Acts, the way the early church did church, one, it was centered around the gospel, yeah. right. you know? Yep. That was what made people yep. come and that's what made people stay. It wasn't that they had extra bread to yep. hand out, you know, which would be, you know, lattes now. Right. And so I, I, I just wonder, <laughs> I wonder if the content that we're presenting yeah. is why it feels irrelevant. Mm, because right. if you're just giving me this passive aggressive yep. Jesus that is supposed to make life happy when right. I'm dealing with anxiety exactly. and stress and divorce and pornography addiction, what does Jesus have to do with that? Yep. But if you're preaching an accurate um, in a specific gospel, then the gospel very much applies to the things that all of us are dealing with. Yeah. And so I just wonder what is it about Jesus that we're not talking about mm -hmm. that makes it feel like church is irrelevant or pointless. The gospel is, is about God. It's not a formula, it's not a method, it's a message. It is the good news that a savior has come to save and set free. Um, in the early church, you see that when the gospel is taught, when Jesus is proclaimed, people come to know him and love him. Uh, that is their entryway into the church, is through salvation. Um, I think that is the method that we should all embody as the church now. I'm going to preach Jesus because if all the lights fail or if the sound ain't that right or uh, I'm not playing the most popular music, let me preach Jesus because I don't want people to come and stay because of something that's temporal. I want people to come and stay because of someone who is eternal, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I don't think you can fail <laughs> in talking about him because I think that's what people want anyway. They, lights are great. You know, we want to see your face, but we need to see his face. That's a huge part of it. Um, from what I've read in the research, this idea that the gospel is divorced from my everyday life mm -hmm. is really what's driving this idea of irrelevance, which mm -hmm. is, so I'm going to church to hear these stories about these people from thousands of years ago that really has nothing to do with the life I'm living today. And I think that we do have to, in, in our approach to the gospel, we have to make it so practical and so relevant and so applicable because once people see their life, mm -hmm in the scripture, right. then it, it opens up. That's and it's true. because the reality is, we know that the Bible is, it's our answer to any challenge that we're facing. Right. Right. But if we're only framing it in terms of, oh, these men, some thousand years ago, this is what they faced. It's like, but how does this relate to me today? Right. And I think that's what this generation is craving for, is right. applicability. Mm -hmm. And I think you've seen the, the trend switch over historically in the American church. I can't speak to the Iranian church or the mm -hmm. Chinese church, or the South African church, but I could speak to the American church. In the 50s, you saw the trend of this subdued, almost like that Mad Men television. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like this, the look and the allure right. of perfection, yeah. but um, there's like a case system, you know, yeah. men, women, you know, almost this look and feel of perfection, but there were problems brewing yeah, within yeah. the yes. nuclear family. The hidden. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so um, when, you know, um, when the baby boomers started to emerge and it's like the 70s babies, you know, now the teenagers coming in, it totally revolutionized oh, yeah. the church. Now you have the hippies, people. yes, <laughs> coming on the scene. And all of a sudden, they're filling the churches. Yep. They're, they're craving Jesus. Yeah. And so it was the Jesus movement, of course. And they revolutionized the church relevancy. We were rethinking how we approached the gospel and made it almost like taking the cookies from the top shelf and yeah. bringing it to the bottom right. to make it relevant. Yes. Not devaluing yes. or watering down the gospel, but to make sure that it was given to everyone instead of making you know principles so lofty with our language. I think God's grace gives us the grace to grow and to change and to maybe even morph in some places where we would be staunch and traditional. Um, uh, I, I pray <laughs> that generations grow in grace on leading the next generation into what God's called them to do. It might not look like the way we did it, but they're supposed to do it the way God wants them to do it. And so um, I just pray that God lets us grow gracefully. Here's the reality, and I've, I've found this to be true, mm -hmm. is 
there are many people who have been in church their whole life, mm -hmm. 60s, 70s, yeah. who don't know the basic fundamentals of the, of the gospel. Absolutely. Right. Because it has not been taught in a way for them that's right. practical religion. and applicable. It's, it's just totally religion. Just religious. Yeah. And, yeah. Or hype. And, and, and even in our, in our heart, which is the good heart to bring a generation, then you know, the, the modern church, we created events. So yes. the platform became yeah. a deal and lights and smoke machines. And listen, I'm all about it. Make it fun, <laughs> make it alive. Yes. But yeah. the message is sacred, right? The method yeah. isn't. The method so, yes. so use whatever. Yeah. But if that's the big deal, then we're still missing right. what you were saying. Right. It's, can Jesus change my life? Yes. Yeah. I'm dealing with loneliness, fear, and addiction. So it's communicating amidst all the bells and whistles. Right, right, right. And that's our, our job, right, is to communicate right. the truth. And so I, I don't mind all of that stuff because I think that can be the attractional church. Like yes. it brings people in. Yeah. But then what are we doing? Yeah. Right? yeah. And how are we encouraging the generations in one church? I think that's the healthiest form of church. Yes. Is when Because we were just talking in the car and you were just saying that, You've been married six years and two weeks. I love that you say that. <laughs> and, um, which is awesome. But for your marriage to thrive and yeah. flourish, yeah. you need to be in yeah. fellowship and community, genuine community with people who've been married 20 oh, yeah. years. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. They can call out stuff in you. Yeah. Right. The good and the bad. One of the funny things about my, my own particular ministry is that people often say, Jackie, you're so wise for your age. Like you have a, a bit of wisdom, right? And part of that is that my mother was older. We would watch mm -hmm. Dateline at night when I was seven. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Mm -hmm. Love it. But a huge part of it is that I've always connected myself to older mm -hmm. women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always. And so, so much of what I know is not me. It's the people I've surrounded myself with. And I think that's the benefit of having a multi-generational church mm -hmm. is that there is only so much wisdom I can pull from somebody right. my same oh, age. Oh, yeah. You have not lived long enough. You right. have not been. You haven't seen enough. enough. Yeah. Right. You right. might know some Bible. You might have right. been to seminary. There, but you have not been able to live it out right, and see yeah. the fruit, right. uh, long lasting exactly. fruit that's come from it. And so I think having generations in a church is huge. Yeah. Tack att du hjälper oss att sprida budskapet om Jesus Kristus som kan förvandla och förändra ut över hela vårt land. För utan dig så kan inte vi göra det här. Så tack och Gud välsigna dig.